Hey, greetings everyone. It is GleeCon, and I am back with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. On our last episode, we ran through the Dead Mines, our second dungeon that we've done for World of Warcraft Classic. We did it with a Rat Paladin, and we did all the quests that were associated with it, and it was a pretty successful run. Didn't take that long. Um, not, not too terrible. Uh, it starts off a little hot and heavy, but then um, it gets pretty pretty good. Uh, so we also have finished off recently the Alliance Player's Guide. We're down to the final two Dungeons and Dragons World of Warcraft uh, role-playing game source books. This one is a monster guide. There was already kind of like a monster manual. So this is the revamped updated version. And I don't know, we might be reading a bunch of this, a uh, bunch of episodes if it looks like it's very lore heavy. Um, or we might be banging this out as we just kind of glance through in one episode if it's very light on the lore and heavy on the stats. Either way, stay a while and listen to the World of Warcraft, the role-playing game, Monster Guide. Uh, this is the first one where I really had a hard time. I could not find it in PDF. I had to go to this bootleg kind of site, and um, it seems like the quality is fine, and it seems like I was able to access the whole book, but... Not a ton. We have a table of contents, so it does go A to Z with a few villains at the end, um, a few other chapters. So it says, Welcome to the World of Warcraft Monster Guide. It says it has a, a huge number of monsters for use. It's organized into the following chapters. Chapter 1, The Dangers of Being a Hero. Um, the bulk of the book, and it contains the monsters we might find. There are 15 of the most infamous and deadly villains in the game. Uh, there's a, ch a brief chapter on how to upgrade monsters, uh, another one for play, uh, pair PC monsters, then monster subtypes and abilities, awarding XP, and then an appendix on monsters and magic. Um, they have other sources. There is Lands of Mystery, which does have a few. The Alliance and Horde Players Guides have some. And Dark Factions. I can't remember if that's one we already read or if that's the last book in the series, I don't remember. Um, so either we already read Dark Factions or that's our final book. Okay, it also discusses, hey, there was a whole manual of monsters. Um, any, It says anything in this book that's duplicate is considered to be uh, replacing it. Now there is a web extra so there, we might actually do a second episode. I kind of think we will, um, where I did notice this when I was looking for this. There is an, an, a free World of Warcraft website extra that has animals and vermin. So we'll look into there. Um, and there is a second appendix too with monster charts. So we'll probably do an addendum to this episode by looking at not looking at that um, as well before we move on to the final book. So, of course, there are, uh, there's name, size, type, subtype, hit dice, initiative, all the stat block features, um, typical Dungeons & Dragons fare. I don't see anything that talks about flavor text. Challenge rating is what an, an appropriate party of fours level should be if you're not familiar with that role, rule. There are templates and villains, yada, yada, yada. All right, so um, we here we go. We're going to just go through the book. We were already um, 10, 11 pages in. Out of the 247. Um, I can't, I'm going to take a peek at the time. So I'm going to see where we're at after about 30 minutes. And if we're close, we'll finish it out. If not, we'll uh, end it. Okay, so there's the Arcane Nullifier X21. I don't even know where you find that. Uh, he... So this is a level eight monster. It says the a technological mockery of a 10 foot tall gnome stands before you, clunking and whirling with steam power. A faint glow comes from within its chest and massive steel fists clench in preparation for battle. The arcane nullifier model X-21 is a technological construct built with the express purpose of combating magical enemies of Nomergon. Okay, so this is one we haven't encountered in the game yet because it's in Nomergon. Based off of the original crowd pummeler, arcane nullifiers are ingenious works of steam technology combined with alchemical prowess and unreal science. Not only are they larger and much stronger than crowd pummelers, but these constructs are also built with a strange contraption 
that nullifies and reflects spells cast upon them. Rare and expensive as the constructs may be, leper gnomes quickly send those constructs out when obvious magical presences intrude into their halls. Arcane nullifiers recognize common, but only an experienced tinker shouting out the correct codes may command them. Some are automated to speak pre-programmed phrase, phrases under certain conditions, but their limited intelligence does not make them the greatest conversationalists. Um, so basically, it prioritizes fighting magic users, it can rechannel a spell, um, and they can be constructed by tinkers. Cool. All right, so then here's the basilisks. Level six creature. Um, I think we've we fought a couple of these in Stone Talon. We're just starting to get to the point where we can fight them. This hulking reptilian beast has a thick plated hide, three clawed feet, and a long jaw studded with sharp teeth. Dozens of tiny glistening crystals are embedded in its hide. Basilisks, giant lizard-like animals, are possessed of barely more than animal intelligence, but can put prey to sleep or even turn enemies to stone if they aren't hungry. While fierce fighters, basilisks do not exhibit cruel or violent tendencies. They defend their territories and hunt other creatures, even sentient ones, for food. Basilisks' hides range from dark chestnut shades of brown to mossy green and ocean blue. Males tend to be larger and brighter than females. Immature basilisks usually stand as tall and wide as an adult boar. Full-grown basilisks grow to 10 feet in length and weigh up to 2,500 pounds. After mating, a basilisk pair remains together for several months. The female buries her eggs in warm earth and rotting plant matter. She guards the eggs while her mate hunts and brings her food. After the young hatch, the male departs. Um, basilisks like to stay at range and put people to sleep. And they have a petrifying, petrifying gaze attack as well. That's pretty much other than that. They're, oh, they're very good at searching. Interesting. All right. The black ooze is a level eight creature. This mass of black viscous liquid flows along the ground in utter silence. Its surface bears an oily sheen. Swirls of glistening copper and silver rise to the surface and then sink back into the black depths. Black oozes form in the foul slag pits of mining operations, given animation by mystic forces and freed to roam and consume. Black oozes possess a corrosive touch that dissolves metal. While their anatomy remains a mystery, they clearly seek to consume flesh as well. Some theorize that angry natural forces inhabited the original black oozes, animating the contaminated waste of mining operations and using it to exact vengeance on the miners. Others postulate that some miners working far too deep in the ground inadvertently operated in areas of powerful buried magic. Mystic energy penetrated the miners' slag pits and animated the sludgy runoff there. Whatever their origins, black oozes now exist as monsters in their own right, requiring no outside influence to live and reproduce, which they do by means of asexual splitting. Black oozes prefer to remain underground, though a few venture out into surrounding mountainsides. They do not appear to have any sort of sentience, society, or animation beyond engulfing whatever they encounter. Uh, okay, cool. Um, and since they're non-intelligent, they don't really have tactics. They do secrete acid. Um, they can constrict when they wrap around you, and they're also good at grabbing, and then they can split. I actually encountered that. We encountered that on the, the Wailing Cavern when we were fighting them. Well, we had one split on us, and it made it very hard. Blood Petal. I don't know how many, if any, Blood Petals we found. There are the typical ones, which are level 7, and Blood Petal Flayers are level 8 creatures. This plant has a huge blood red flower and a thick stem extending five feet to the ground. The creature ambles along on many wiry roots, which act like legs. Its thorn-covered arms wave back and forth menacingly. Blood petals are ambulatory plants that dwell in the steamy jungles of the Unguro Crater. They are covered in nasty thorns that exude a crippling toxin. Although not terribly dangerous alone, they tend to use swarm tactics, otherwise... Not much is known about these curious creatures, although the Explorers League produces a few reports. Colonies of blood petals, apparently always less than 30 in number, stake out a territory, typically in some remote area where threats are at a minimum. They defend this area carefully while new blood petal sprouts grow. A sprout remains immobile for several months before its legs fully develop. Once a blood petal patch grows too large for nearby resources to support it, the creatures send out scouts. These scouts range far and wide and thus are usually the first blood petals a visitor to Ungoro encounters. 
Interestingly, a scout avoids conflict and only fights to defend itself, giving the illusion that blood petals aren't terribly aggressive, a fact that leads many explorers into trouble when they encounter an actual patch. Blood petals typically stand about five feet high and weigh about 100 pounds. They speak no languages as far as anyone knows, although they do seem capable of communicating with each other in some unknown manner. Um, they strike out with thorny arms using a piercing thorns. They also have poison and they can put a thorn shield by covering their body in thorns. The blood petal flares appear no different than a standard blood petal until it enters combat, at which point it becomes apparent that it is quicker and stronger. A flare's vines and thorns swell up with internal fluids, giving it enhanced abilities in combat. Blood petal flares are almost never encountered alone. They are the primary defenders of a blood petal patch and fight to the death if their colony comes under attack. Um, they attack anyone they see. They have poison and serrated thorns. So they're particularly vicious doing triple crit damage. And they have a whirlwind strike, uh, like an AoE attack. Okay. All right. Bees are now done. We're moving on to C's with the carrion grub. Um, I can't even see what their level is. That blocks. They level. This is a level ten creature. Ah, this is like a plague lands creature. I don't know that we fought any of these yet. A fat, sickly, human-sized yellow worm undulates its way along the ground. A trail of sizzling slime in its wake. Smallish pincer-like mandibles dripping with green ichor extend and retract from a tiny sucker-like mouth. Carrion grubs are disgusting worms that roam the plague lands, searching for corpses to consume. They devour prey by gripping it in acid-coated mandibles, dissolving it, and sucking it up through their relatively tiny mouths. If they cannot find dead or dying creatures to feed upon, any living flesh will do. Carrion grubs prefer mammals, but will dine on reptiles or fish. They are voracious eaters that can consume close to half their body weight in a day. They cannot digest vegetable matter. Carrion grubs roam only and have appeared the, in the plague lands there only in recent years. It is unclear if they are the result of horrible experiments by overzealous necromancers or simply a mutation created by the scourge. Since they pursue undead flesh as readily as the living, it seems unlikely anyone created them on purpose. Carrion grubs move about haphazardly, constantly seeking food. If they detect suitable prey with their blind sense, they move to investigate, attacking rapaciously if the prey proves edible. If the food source moves out of blind sense range, the grub continues moving in the same directions until it catches up, comes to an obstacle, or detects another food source. Although grubs are stupid, their blind sense is quite acute, and they will not, for example, pursue prey over the edge of a cliff. If confronted by a foe that cannot be attacked, such as flying archers, the grub escapes by burrowing. A carrion grub can wiggle its way only into soft earth, sand, or materials of a similar consistency. Most carrion grubs are eight to, 6 to 8 feet long and weigh 300 to 500 pounds, although much larger specimens exist. In combat, they just attack the nearest force, uh, so like a target. They can spray acid. They have a acetic slime they coat with. They wiggle around in death throws and explode in acid. They can also spit acid. They have a maggot body, which makes them hard to grapple. Disgusting. <laughs> All right, cloud serpents. Um, I guess these winged serpents, we did fight some in the Wailing Caverns recently. They're only level four. The sky blue winged serpent has dark blue plumage. Its fangs no doubt bear poison, but they are unmistakably surrounded by tiny crackles of electricity. Cloud serpents are magical wind serpents. See the web extras. Oh, gotcha. So we haven't fought this specific version with the ability to breathe lightning. Larger on average than normal wind serpents by at least half a foot. They also vary in color from sky blue to deep purple with blue and or green plumage. They are more aggressive, at least in part due to the fact that their larger size requires more food. Cloud serpents prefer to make their nests in the high cracks or infrequent oases of Thousand Needles, feeding on anything that wanders into their territory. Many live near the coasts of the area, feeding off fish and crabs. Um, they shoot lightning breath. They also do have poison bites, and they're uh, good at detecting and sneaking. Uh, here we go. Um, this is a core hound, but there's a... Uh, there's a way to advance core hounds. These are level 14 creatures. We have not fought these yet. The beast appears to be a massive bulldog with two heads. Each mouth is filled with rows of flaming teeth. Its body is covered with armored hide and small bony spikes. A streak of flames runs down its spine from head to stubby tail. 
Corehounds are the vicious but faithful servants of Ragnaros and his minions. The oldest and most powerful of the Corehounds is Magmadar, the alpha male and sire of the entire current pack. Corehounds understand Kalamag, but cannot speak. They use simple uh, tactics. They try to pin you down, grab you, and bite you with their heads, and they regenerate um, unless they're struck with cold. Okay, so to advance core hounds, um, they can get up to this. Let's see, hit dice is 18. They can go basically tw up to twice as strong as the, the one we just read about. Um, eventually, they'll gain Ancient Despair, which is like a, a frightful presence, which can upgrade further to an Ancient Dread or an Ancient Hysteria. They have a breath weapon. Um, their body can burn with brutal flames. They can develop a frightful presence. Ground Stomp, they can shoot a Lava Bomb, Magma Spit. They can mangle an extra serrated bite, um, which is the next move. They can thrash around um, when they grab, and basically their grappling does more damage. They can Vicious Bite, which is extra damage to stamina, so they can shred your stamina. They have a withering heat coming off their body. They eventually can gain Blind Sense and True Seeing. Okay, any random corrupted creature. So if this example they get us is a fell orc. The fell energies of the twisting nether warp and defile all things around them, arising through fonts such as corrupted moon wells or the radiation flooding Nomergon. These energies are powerful enough to twist and mutate even living beings into horrible mockeries of nature. Corrupted creatures are in perpetual pain, Lumps of flesh fall off them periodically as the fell energies destroy their bodies. Corrupted creatures appear much like their former selves, but more primal and savage. Fell energies run through their veins, augmenting their strength and endurance and empowering their attacks as well. They attack anything that moves, their corrupted nature deriving pleasure from destruction. Occasionally, a corrupted creature is called by some other moniker, such as cursed or fell. So to create one, you basically just take the creature, add a fell strike and fell poison, and give it some special qualities of, they gain the ferocity quality. It, they lose mental capacity, but gain strength and uh, additional chaos, uh, challenge rating level adjustment. They're always chaotic evil. Uh, the fell orc is a creature that seems, a, this creature seems a massive orc wielding a horrible axe. Upon closer examination, you notice its blood-red skin, its glowing eyes, and the feral snarl upon its lips. Fell orcs, also known as chaos orcs, are the creation of Manoroth, who blessed the orc race by infusing within them fell energies and binding their will to the Burning Legion. While Grom's sacrifice, see the timeline in the introduction to the World of Warcraft role-playing game, freed most of his race, many orcs remain loyal to Manoroth and worship the demons, gaining tremendous strength in exchange for their service. While not all demon-worshipping orcs are fell orcs, more than enough still partake of demon blood for the strength it grants them. This creature uses the Elite Ability Score Array, um, which I guess we're going to learn about that in Chapter 3. And they just go into a rage and fight recklessly. All right, here's Crowd Plum Pummeler 960, which we read about earlier, which we kind of hinted at in the first entry. Only a level 4. A squat construct stands at attention before you. It's one green robotic eye watching the area around it. The being is made of red pipes and pistons, and its massive fists look lethal. You know, this little guy. Crowd Pummelers Model 960 are cheap and easy to maintain devices made for sentry duty, patrolling the streets of Nobrangon. Crowd Pummelers bash anything they notice that violates the laws programmed into them. Since Nobrangon's fall, most are programmed to attack anything that is not a leper gnome. Crowd pummelers recognize common, but only an experienced tinker using the correct technological codes may command them. In the past, a pummeler warned nearby violators aloud, giving them a short time to halt their offenses, but now all they say is intruder before charging. And that's all they do. They just charge and fight. Um, they can be constructed by tinkers as well, and they're good scouts. All right, crypt fiends. Mummified spider creatures, crypt fiends, are in the enslaved undead of the once powerful New Rubian race. For ages after the ancient Karaji Empire fell to the trolls, the New Rubians lived a quiet existence in Northrend, rebuilding their shattered power and replenishing their forces. Then came the Lich King, whose rise the Nerubians of the Jol Nerub watched 
with dismay, for they feared that such a powerful enemy would thwart their own bid for dominance. The ruler of Ajol Naruba, a Nerubian spider lord named Anubarak, led its forces in an offensive against Ice Crown. A bitter war raged across the frozen glacier and beneath it in the subterranean city of Ajol Nerub. Despite the Nerubians' natural immunities, the Lich King had the power of the Dreadlords and his undead armies at his command. In the end, undead legions swarmed the tunnels of Ajol Nerub and the Nerubian Empire fell for a second time. The Lich King animated fallen Nerubians as crypt fiends. Their leaders, including the powerful Anubarak, found a second life as crypt lords under the Lich King's control. Now the crypt fiends find themselves bound in unwilling slavery to the Scourge. Most despise their condition but lack the power to break free of the Lich King's domination. Some crypt fiends are tortured, maddened creatures raging constantly at their shameful condition and taking out their frustration on their enemies. Crypt lords suffer even more. Their transformation allows them greater intelligence and power, so they feel more keenly the limitations their masters impose. However, undeath also brings might, and many crypt fiends and crypt lords alike revel in their power. Particularly ambitious Nerubian spider lords seek out the Lich King's transformation. Nerubians despise these turncoats, branding, branding them traitors of, to, of Ajol Nerub, but these same traitors appear the most likely to rise to positions of leadership in the Scourge. Crypt fiends appear somewhat as they did in life, spiderish creatures with six spindly claw-tipped legs. They also possess humanoid torsos with two arms for a total of eight limbs. They are obviously undead, with withered flesh bound in linen bandages and skeletally gaunt faces. A crypt lord's carapace looks dull and worn and its eyes burn with an unholy light. Okay, so these are created... Um, and because I guess these are probably able to be played as character abilities. Um, they do gain special attacks in the forms of poison and webs, and the Crypt Lords also have the ability to generate carrion beetles as a la World Warcraft 3, and they can impale and summon locust swarms. They do have fast healing, and Crypt Lords also have a spiked carapace. An example Crypt Fiend would be a Nerubian Worker Crypt Fiend. This is a level 6 creature. This creature has the lower body of a spider and the torso of a humanoid with a spider-like head. It looks mummified, bandages wrap its arms and six legs, and its flesh is desiccated. These are some of the Lich King's most feared soldiers. They don't know fear. They shoot their poisons and webs and have fast healing, and they're good at, like, spotting, detecting stealth. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to check after I finish each level. I think we, um, we're probably a little bit more than halfway into where I want to go. But I'm not gonna. I'm gonna at least finish off a letter each time. So now we're gonna look at dark siders, dark hounds. I'm sorry. These are level one. Oh, these little annoying turds. This creature resembles a um, a purple hunting hound with a shaggy black mane and a horrible set of fangs. Two horns sprout out of its forehead, and another pair emerges from its shoulders. Dark hounds are demonic dogs. These creatures frequent forests, traveling either by themselves or in small packs, hunting and killing any living creature as they find it. Unlike normal dogs, dark hounds kill for the sheer joy of the kill. They rarely eat what they hunt. No one really knows where dark hounds came from. They appeared shortly after the Third War, terrorizing the wildlife of the former elven kingdoms. While the Forsaken hunting and living in Trisful Glades consider them only a minor nuisance, occasionally a large enough pack poses a threat to alchemists exploring the woods for components. Many warlocks instead keep the, the monsters as pets, training them to be even more lethal than normal. Dark Hounds understand basic Aradun, but being little better than beasts, they cannot speak. And that's it. They just bite. They can jump and bite. All right. Now we have the dinosaur class, which we're going to, I guess, condense them all right here in the Ds. These ancient lizards inspire awe and not class, but like category of, mon of creature. They inspire awe and respect wherever they go. While animals, dinosaurs possess a might and magnificence that places them above other creatures of the natural world. Many sentient races revere dinosaurs or consider it a test of personal honor to hunt one of the great beasts, like the Zandalari. While many different types of dinosaurs exist, most are carnivores and thus share the same basic traits. Their forelimbs tend to prove ill-suited for combat, so they attack with their horned heads and teeth. They stake out territories and guard them fiercely. This territorial instinct exists in herbivorous dinosaurs as well, but they tend to more peaceful behavior, attacking only when a creature wounds or threatens them. Dinosaurs have rough reptilian skin, thick and pebbly in texture. Their coloration varies, but many dinosaurs tend to blend in well with their natural surroundings. As cold-blooded creatures, they avoid areas of extreme temperature such as Arctic regions, 
Most dinosaurs nest in the Unguro Crater and the Sholazar Basin, which possess a pleasing climate as well as abundant territory and prey. One exception is the Threshodon, which lives in several places throughout Azeroth. Yeah, we have fought some of those already. Several, some di and raptors too. Some dinosaurs make excellent riding mounts, like raptors. All right, we'll begin with the Devil Soar, level 10. This giant lizard walks on two powerfully muscled hind legs. Its stunted yet sharp clawed forelimbs stretch out before it and rows of bloodstained teeth fill its maw. Mud spatters its pale green hide. The Devil Soar got its name from its vicious, relentless attacks during which it savages its victims to death. Devil Soar uses its bite to assault its prey, and its powerful hind legs allow it to chase down almost anything. Despite the ferocity of this ill-tempered beast, hunters prize its extraordinarily tough but supple hide and often seek it out. Some theorize that the Devil Soar's foul temper developed over years of people hunting and skinning its kind. Devil Soars grow to 30 feet tall and weigh almost 16 tons. Females tend to be smaller and lighter than males, but are even more aggressive. In a reversal of most creatures' natural gender roles, a female devil sower abandons her eggs as soon as she leaves that lays them. Male devil sowers can identify a clutch of eggs they fathered by scent and protect that clutch until the eggs hatch. Interesting. Um, they just charge and fight when they see you. They can grab you with their head and locking jaws and then savage you, shaking you around. Um, and they can also swallow whole and you'd have to kind of cut your way out. All right, these, there's the die Matrodon. I've always thought that was silly. Level eight, thick shell-like plates cover this dinosaur's thick hide. It's six powerful stumpy legs end in sharp claws and jagged teeth line its mouth. Two enormous jagged red crests protrude from its back. The die Matrodon, one of the strongest predators in the Ungoro crater, stalks its prey and rips it apart without mercy. This creature uses both its squat strong legs tipped with sharp claws and its wickedly fanged mouth to great advantage, tearing apart its prey without a second thought. Um, Dimetrodons lumber straight into battle. They rip with their claws and teeth. They can actually use their razor crest when grappling to do extra slashing damage. And because they have six legs, kind of like a basilisk, they're very stable. Um, so they can't be pushed around. The Terror Dax. The, sensing a theme here with their names, level six creatures. Claw-tipped wings stretch out from the back of this reptilian creature. Green eyes shine above a long beak-like snout lined with razor teeth. Terror Dax soar through the air using their keen predator senses to satisfy their taste for fresh meat. These fierce creatures stand as tall as a horse and weigh up to 1,500 pounds. Their pigmentation ranges from moss green to deep emerald, while weaker than other dinosaurs, Terror Dax possess great agility. Pterodax prefer to hunt alone. Normally, adventurers encounter them in pairs only during mating season, a two-week period in the springtime. Pterodax may form flights when their breeding grounds are threatened by a strong foe, but disband once they eliminate the threat. Stegodons, obviously, they are in the Thunder Lizard family. These are level 10 creatures. The massive reptilian creature heaves itself along on four legs the size of tree trunks, a stunted tail sticks out behind it, and dark green spikes cover its body. An enormous tusk extends from its blunt snout. Stegodons are short-tempered, aggressive, but or herbivorous dinosaurs, but easily irritated they attack trespassers on sight, but rarely venture from their territories. They consume vast quantities of plant matter and grow angry when logging, mining, and other such activities disturb their food sources. They just charge and try to impale you with their horn. Threshodons, we've also seen them underwater. Level 4 creatures. This beast has a large body, thick rough skin, and flippers. Its long neck supports a vaguely snake-like head with many needle-sharp teeth. Though it resides primarily in the water, a Threshodon breathes only air. A Threshodon has a total length of some 15 feet, including a tail about half as long as the main portion of its body. It's kind of stubby and weighs about 1,000 pounds. Observers who see only its head or tail might easily mistake it for a massive serpent. Um, it's aggressive and it just comes and attacks and it's very good at sneaking in the water. I know I've been caught by them before. Uh, we are now moving on to another D section, dire animals. Dire animals are tougher, larger, more aggressive versions of ordinary animals and they have feral, prehistoric, or even in some cases, demonic appearance. 
So we have dire apes. These are level three. This large gorilla has silver down its back. Its shaggy coat does little to hide the muscles in its frame, which bulge far more than normal muscles should. They're about nine feet tall and weigh from 800 to 1,200 pounds, and they rend by grappling on with their fists and trying to rip you in half. Dire bats are level two creatures. This enormous bat looks like something out of a nightmare. Its wings are clawed and its fangs long. 15 feet, about 200 pounds. It has blind sense and it's good in otherwise just detecting its swoops and fights. Dire bears are level seven creatures. Um, this great bear has bony protrusions all over its body. Um, as if its skeleton were trying to fight its way out. The omnivorous dire bear usually does not bother creatures that assiduously try to avoid it, but it aggressively defends a kill or other source of food. It does not hesitate to rip apart anything that might contain something edible. It's 12 feet long and weighs about 800 pounds, and it can use it and improve grab, basically a bear hug. Dire boars are level four. Spines adorn this enormous boar's back and neck. Its tusks are long, sharp, and barbed, and its small red eyes seem to burn with a wicked intelligence. Dire boars are omnivorous and spend most of their time rooting around, which, much like ordinary pigs do, they viciously attack anything that approaches them. However, they can grow up to 12 feet long and weigh as much as 2,000 pounds, and they have the ferocity feet, so they're tough to bring down. Dire condors are level five. This great creature's, this great bird's wingspan is at least 15 feet. Its eyes burn with feral wickedness and rough bony protrusions jut from its beak and talons. Dire condors are carrion birds that create their own carrion. Unlike smaller buzzards, the dire condors willingly attack live prey. The dire condor has a wingspan of 15 feet, weighs about 200 pounds. It swoops down, and it can also knock you down with a wing slap. Um, and it has, it's a bird, so it can spot better. Dire hyenas are level four creatures. This massive striped animal has slavering jaws. It throws its head back and screams an hysterical seeming laugh. Dire hyenas chase both lions and their smaller cousins away from prey hunting in packs. They are particularly dangerous. Dire hyenas are about eight feet long and five feet high and weigh more than 800 pounds. Um, and they can trip, they can basically bring you down like a pack animal and then they're good at hiding too. Hmm. Okay, we have the dire lion level five creature. This lion's mane is great and bushy and looks to have thorns mixed with fire. Fur, uh, mixed with the fur. Its face constantly betrays a look of aggression. Dire lions are patient hunters just like their smaller cousins, but apt to take on considerably larger prey. They can grow to be 15 feet long and weigh up to 3,500 pounds. Once they pounce, they can really lock you down with an improved bite. They rake with both claws, and they're very good at stealth. Dire gargoyle, I think we've moved out of dire animals. The color has changed. These are level 9 creatures, plus gargoyles aren't creatures. Uh, are animals. This creature is slightly smaller than a human with wiry muscles and sharp claws. Its eyes glow with pale blue light. It has angular features and pale bat-like wings. It has white skin nearly translucent lined with bluish veins. Its skin looks like quartz or marble. Dire gargoyles are among the most vicious and violent of creatures in all Azeroth. They are bloodthirsty, sadistic, and frighteningly destruction in a frighteningly destructive race. Gargoyles aren't undead creatures, nor are they necessarily allies of the Lich King. Normal gargoyles are less intelligent and less humanoid than dire gargoyles. As a result, Arthas is not bothered to enslave normal gargoyles. However, Arthas does consider the dreaded gargoyles of Northrend his allies. All gargoyles have rough, crystalline hides that are resistant to many attacks. Also, they can land when needed and convert their hides into a stone-like substance. They cannot attack in this state, but their health regeneration increases. Despite their humanoid appearance, gargoyles are not sentient. Oh. Um, they're very sneaky. They swoop down and can rend with their claws. They can also take on a stone form, which gives them regeneration and toughness. And they, um, they have extreme vitality. So they're very good at resisting life draining. All right, we're now onto Doom Guards. These are the toughest things we've read about so far. They're level 18 creatures. This hulking, demonic humanoid emanates immense power and malevolence. Its skin is blood red and large bat-like wings stretch from its back. Dark flame engulfs its sword with its green glowing eyes settle upon its next kill. When mortals recall the brutal terror of, burn of the Burning Legion's armies, they likely first think of the Doomguard. 
These iron-fisted demons serve as the Burning Legion's captains and generals. Countless worlds have fallen to their brilliant and ruthless military tactics. A Doomguard's prowess at commanding large-scale battles does not reduce the demon's hunger for personal combat. In any conflict, a Doomguard brings its powerful demonic abilities to where they can do the most damage, viciously slaughtering enemy troops or personally eliminating a bothersome mage. While most Doom Guard remain unquestioning and loyal servants to the Lords of the Burning Legion, Nathrazim, and Pit Lords, among others, some ascend to this tier of command themselves and are among the most powerful demons in the Legion. In fact, most demons that remain in Azeroth after the failure of the Second Invasion are now under the control of various Doom Guard Lords, ruling from such places as Jadenar, Manorok Coven, and the Tainted Scar. A typical Doom Guard stands about 10 feet tall and weighs about 4,000 pounds, so some become much larger. Doom guards speak Eridun, and many also speak one or more languages of the mortal races as well. So they like to swoop in and use some of their spells, such as Shadow Strike and Unholy Aura, to buff up, and then use Shadow Burn and Immolate to help, and they can also Rain of Fire or Hellfire spells. Um, they like to um, use a Falchion, uh, but they can also dual wield scimitars, long swords or a single handed wheel and they have uh, wield them and they use enchanted ones usually they have an immortal infection when they in, when they hit you uh, that's that creates a tainting debuff and they have lots of spell like abilities like blasphemy uh dragons i had a feeling we were going to be on doing dragons as well okay Since before the first days of mortal history, the five mighty aspects and their children have guarded and protected Azeroth. The aspects are the leaders of each of the five greatest flights, black, blue, bronze, green, and red, and empowered by the Titans to protect one part of the world. For a time, all dragons worked as one to safeguard the land and protect it from invasion and corruption. Sadly, this situation was not to last. About the time the Night Elves unwittingly contacted the Burning Legion, a sinister force irrevocably tainted the mind of Neltharion, the mighty earth warder and ruler of the Black Dragonflight. When the Legion finally came to Azeroth, the Dragonflight sought to fulfill their duty and strike against these invading demons. To do this, Neltharion and his blood, ma blood and magic created the Dragon Soul, a powerful artifact that contained the fragments of the other aspect's souls. The earth warder withheld his own. Neltharion had already lost his mind to madness, however, and when the time came, he turned the Dragon Soul against his fellow dragons, decimating the Blue Dragonflight and forcing the others into retreat. A skillful group of mortals managed to steal the artifact away from Neltharion, now called Deathwing, before he could cause further damage. Thousands of years later, Deathwing set a new plan in motion. Under Deathwing's influence, an orc chieftain named Zulahed re rediscovered the demon soul. As leader of the Dragon Maul clan, Zulahed tried to use the artifact, but his shamanic magic had no effect on the demon soul. In the hope that darker magic might prevail, Zula had entrusted the powerful artifact to the only warlock he trusted, Necro's Skull Crusher. Over time, Necro's learned to wield the demon so well enough to enslave the famed dragon queen, Alexstrasza, and through her the rest of the Red Dragon flight. The orcs forced the Red Dragons to fight for the Horde against their will in the Second War. Horilstraz, one of the Dragon Queen's surviving mates, guided the human mage Ronin and his companions to Grim Batal, where they successfully freed Alexstrasza from her imprisonment. Since that time, the aspects have secluded themselves and the dragon flights have all but disappeared from mortal sight. Many still roam the world in the forms of humans, elves, and other mortal races, seeking to guide the mortal races for their protection, or in some cases, for other darker purposes. All right, so dragons have blind sense. They have a boundless mind, which is a benefit we'll talk about uh, later. They also all have breath weapons and can crush by landing on you. They also possess frightful presence, like in D&D, &D, and they have immunities to certain magical effects and sleep and paralysis and stuff. All right, so black dragons. The whelps are level five, the drakes are level 15. The scaled creature looks almost friendly at first, but you quickly note the deceptive glint in the whelps eyes. The creature's grin is not a greeting, but rather an indication of its pleasure at seeing you. Perhaps it's hungry. The dragon's dark scales make it almost impossible to see as it moves in and out of the shadows. Black whelps are trained to kill from the moment they emerge from their eggs. In some cases, they are ready to fight even before that. Terrible and vicious, these predators delight in inflicting pain on the mortal races, though many can speak they typically do so only to get close enough to strike. They speak common and draconic. They have a fire breath weapon, lava, and some spell-like abilities. Uh, black drakes. This black dragon's murderous intent is clear from its posture even before you have a chance to look into its eyes. 
Massive yet sinuous, the dra dragon spreads its wings and roars a challenge, jaws snapping the air in anticipation. The midnight scales reflect the ambient light brightly. That's a cool picture of one. Making the beast look even more nightmarish. Looks like straight from the game. Your average black drink's goal in life is no less than to become Deathwing's right hand or replacement, and thus to control the rest of the flight in conquering or destroying the natural world. Black Dragon society is ruled by the powerful, and its laws are enforced by brute strength, cunning, and magical power. By this age, a black drake has already proven itself to be a survivor. Most blacks don't even make it to adulthood, with nearly every creature in the world, including its own kind, looking to take its head or its hide. Um, they, st they also have the breath weapon, and they gain a couple extra spellic abilities, such as Fire Blast. All right, bronze dragons. We have the whelps, which are level five, and the uh, drakes, which are level 15. At first, the dragon seems almost like a statue. Its metallic scales gleam in the sunlight as if freshly polished. However, the strange statuesque creature clearly watches you almost perfectly still, except for its faintly glowing eyes. Bronze whelps are the small, intelligent children of the bronze dragon flight. Just a shade smaller than the children of the other flights, they learn to compensate with extreme speed, but this fact isn't immediately apparent from looking at them. Bronze whelps are among the most patient of all living creatures, and on an initial encounter, they aren't likely to move for several minutes unless threatened. They are highly curious, observing anything they find interesting from a distance at first, and then from it closer if necessary. They are friendly to humanoid races, but they may seem a bit distant or egotistical. They have a breath weapon, which is also a cone of fire, and they have some arcane missiles and dancing light type of skills. The drakes watch you from a distance, Little emotion showing on its features. Its scales are pristine and beautiful, but as you stare into them, they seem almost to shift on the dragon's form. After a few moments of disorientation, you turn your gaze back to the dragon's eyes. The magnificent creature seems to smile slightly. The brood of Nosdormu has traditionally been one of the closest to mortal societies, although few realize this fact. Though many bronze dragons went into hiding when Deathwing once again began capturing the eggs of other flights, some bronzes remain near human cities, often in the guise of a human or elf. Bronze dragons are concerned with making sure the flow of time is properly maintained, but some also lend a hand to mortal society and help maintain the safety of the world at large. Generally, bronze dragons are aloof and introspective, constantly thinking and debating options in their minds. Bronze dragons speak common and draconic in many other languages as well. They still have that fire breath weapon, and they can also... Their spell, like, I believe, is expand to lightning shield, lightning bolts, iron body, discern locations. All right, the old green dragon flight. Well, so I've drakes 15, just like the others. The verdant hatchling is small, but nevertheless it exudes a spiritual aura, one that implies great wisdom even in such a young creature. Its wings look barely large enough to keep it aloft, yet it manages to be imposing in spite of its seeming frailty. Green whelps are precious to the green dragonflight, especially with the increasing danger of a mysterious dark force that seems to have arisen in the Emerald Dream. Dream um, green whelps spent much of their time in the Emerald Dream in the past, but those children who have not yet experienced travel to the dream have fortunately been kept from entering and thus are safe from contamination. Most green whelps in the world are found under the careful watch of an older dragon. They speak common Darnassian and Draconic. Uh, green whelps usually retreat if engaged in combat. If doing so is impossible, they use their breath weapon or try to use magic to increase the chances of escaping. Their breath weapon is an acid breath weapon, um, but they also can use it to cause sleep, and they can cure and um, commune with nature and animals. The drakes have a look of sadness and pain clear on their features of the majestic beast. It, it appears to be struggling with something inside itself, something threatening its very essence. The creature's once brilliant scales have dimmed to a forest green. The green dragon flight was until recently one of the few that still flourished. It was only recently that disaster struck. Green dragons, clearly insane due to some sort of corruption, appeared on Azeroth. A dark and corruptive force seems to have arisen in the Emerald Dream. While the strongest of the green dragons seek the answer to this mystery, typical drakes, the average adults of the flight, try their best simply to maintain order and keep themselves and their young alive and well. Um, in combat, they still have the same breath weapon. They can also gain Mark of the Wild um, as a buff and can commune with nature. So not that much more. Red dragons, same thing. Whelps 5, drakes 15. Scales resembling solid flame glisten on the small dragon's form. Although not great in size, she nevertheless has wicked claws and her fangs are visible as she turns her head. Though clearly as a predatory creature, the glint of wisdom and kindness shines in her eyes. 
Red whelps are the youngest of red dragon kind. These hatchlings are highly intelligent unless newborn. They know enough about humanoid creatures to be friendly even when first encountered. They are suspicious of orcs and avoid them if possible due to the horde's previous enslavement of the red flight. Those red whelps raised near Grim Atoll are more aggressive due to the events that occurred there and possibly for other reasons connected to the contents of the fortress. They just speak common and draconic. They have a breath weapon, obviously a fire attack. Um, and they can cure and speak with animals as well. A golden orbs scrutinize your every motion, obviously judging whether you to, whether you might be friend or foe. Your eyes take on the dragons, take in the dragon's life frame. Although large, the crimson drake is graceful and noble in form. The fiery horns atop the dragon's skull resemble a crown upon the head of a worthy king. Red drakes are the adults of the red dragon flight, and most are fully grown at this stage. Once friends to nearly every living creature, red dragons are now much more suspicious, tending to seek only the company of their own kind. The capture of the dragon queen and the accompanying loss of a great number of their flight has left reds crippled but not defeated. Although many reds feel they owe a debt of gratitude to the Alliance for its assistance in Alex Straza's rescue, others distrust all mortals, noting that even the night elves once brought danger and death to the world. Generally, though, red dragons are friendly to humans, elves, and their other traditional friends and allies. For the most part, it is the representatives of the flight New Grim Atoll who are strangely hostile to any outsiders. Red drakes typically consider the various horde races to be enemies, well, with the possible exception of Torin, whom they respect for their druidic abilities. Um, and they have gained, in addition to everything else, some dispel magic and detect thoughts. Notice we didn't cover the blue dragon flight, and that's because their stat blocks are already in one of the other books that we've read. Dragon Spawn. So there are Dragon Spawn Wormkin, which are level 3, and Dragon Spawn Scalebane, which are level 7. Standing tall on four well muscled legs, the creature flexes massive arms, clearly capable of swinging its sword with deadly force. Its scaled armor is an enameled sapphire blue, brighter than the color of the natural scales that cover the majority of its human humanoid upper body. The creature's head resembles that of a small azure dragon. I feel like we've read about these two. Dragon spawn are monstrous beings trained to serve under the five dragon flights of the world, and some say they evolved from humans who dedicated their lives to servitude under the great dragons. Wormkin are the most common and low ranking of the spawn, but they are nonetheless fierce opponents in battle. Um, they just use weapons and fight like humanoids, and they have heritage qualities depending on what color they are. Um, the Scalebane are the most elite of the dragon spawn, and they represent a small fraction of dragon spawn society. These are the leaders, the most powerful. Spellcasters and the elders of the dragon spawn race. While all scalebanes were wormkin earlier in life, scalebanes are technically a different species, having been transformed by a complicated ritual similar to those undergone by dragons as they mature. Scalebanes are chosen from the best of the lesser ranks, those who demonstrate exceptional leadership as well as combat or magical abilities. While most scalebanes are intellectual, they are still powerfully built for combat, standing seven feet tall on average. Many scalebanes carry banners representing their draconic patron or matron, such as Azure Ghost, the blue, or Velastraws, the red. Um, it says that Wormkin can be played as characters. I think we'll kind of address that in one of the chapters at the end. The Dreadlord, aka the Nathrazine. These are level 20 creatures. All right, so now that we have a new champion, highest, uh, most powerful thing so far in the book. Sheer malice radiates from the, this white-skinned humanoid. Leathery black bat wings unfurl from its back, and two shining black horns curve back from its brow. Its arms end in long claws, and in place of feet, it has polished cloven hooves. Dreadlords, masters of trickery, deceit, and guile, take pride in the fiendish destruction they have wrought in Az on Azeroth. Affiliated with the Burning Legion for centuries, the Dreadlords, also termed Nathrazim, acted as commanders of undead legions during the Burning Legion's second invasion, slaughtering thousands with unnatural hordes. The Dreadlords lost much power when several of their most influential members fell to the Forsaken Armies under Sylvanas Windrunner's banner. Now the Dreadlords seem almost a myth, a story told to frighten children. People feel safer when they think the Dreadlords are a remote tale. Some instead can comfort themselves with the lie that the Great Baron Mathras is the only surviving Dreadlord. More practical swords know that evil never truly dies, and that just because they cannot see something does not mean it is not there. Dreadlords invariably stay behind the scenes and effect change through proxies. Adventurers might go their whole lives and never realize a Dreadlord has acted against them in countless seemingly unrelated ways, as we found out in Shadowlands. Only after much exertion and investigation do the heroes uncover the Dreadlord behind a plot, 
Even then the task of tracking and slaying a dreadlord can overwhelm the most competent hunter of evil. Dreadlords live in heavily fortified lairs or march at the center of an army. They most often take arcanist levels, but some dreadlords favor the physical arts of the rogue or warrior. Dreadlords can speak with any creature that has a language. They can dominate as a, as a power like the spell. They drain energy, you know, causing you to lose levels. They have spell-like abilities, powerful teleportation, hold monster, plane shift, nightmare and dream, summon swarm of bats, and they can cast spells as a 17th level caster, necromancer. Um, they can also summon infernals to fight for them, and they have a vampiric aura around them. They also gain fiendish defense, giving them buff extra armor, and they have spell resistance. Dark Iron Dwarfs, for now, they're considered monsters, although they're playable. As you can see, they have uh, they can be played as characters. They're level one, but of course, they could be any level, really. This dwarf has a pallid skin and black hair. Orange eyes burn from an impassive face. Dark Iron Dwarves are the Bronzebeard and Wildhammer Dwarves' evil kin. 300 years ago, the Dark Iron Clan split from the Bronzebeard and Wildhammer Clans during the violent War of the Three Hammers. During the battles, the Dark Iron leader Thorissen inadvertently summoned Ragnaros, a blazing and ancient elemental whose rebirth into Azeroth tore the land asunder. Ragnaros' summoning destroyed the city of Thorissen, and its place in its place sat a great volcano that dwarves would later name Black Rock Spire. Ragnaros bent the remaining Dark Irons to his will, and he and his new servants retreated to the safety of the Black Rock Spire's depths. Now the Dark Irons have returned to the surface. The Third War's devastation leaves Ironforge with few allies, and the world is ripe for a Dark Iron emergence. Their current battles are mainly against the Black Dragon Nefarian and his allies, who claim Black Rock Spire's upper reaches. Dark Iron forces are scattered across Cosmodon, searching for items and slaves to help them destroy their ancient enemies. Dark Iron Dwarves typically resemble Bronzebeard Dwarves, but they are less stocky and more dexterous. Their skin is pale white to sickly gray, and their hair and beards are white, black, or orange. Their eyes glow with orange flame, one of many gifts from their fiery master. They speak dwarven. And they fight like a typical dwarf, and they can be, you can make them into playable characters as well. Um, and when they take levels, you can have uh, these other traits. Um, yeah, they have fire, magic, affinity, and resistance to fire, and they like to be rogues more than anything else. All right, so this is where we're going to stop. We've gone A through D. Uh, it, it's not, but if you look at the book, we're actually like 20, 25% of the way through the book. So it, it's probably a, a, a front loaded, a little bit heavy, but we'll pick up. So this, this book will take us a few episodes, still shorter than most of the others. But hey, we got another episode in the fight pipe, five by five. And I thank you as always so much for watching and listening. You know, I'm going to see you next time on Lore of Warcraft.